Um, so, uh, hi, uh, I'm Avishai, and apparently I'm an alcoholic. Uh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, alcohol much. Um, I work at uh, Aleph. Aleph is a venture capital fund. Uh, basically, we fund startups. We give money to startups. And you might be asking yourself, uh, what the hell is an engineer doing at a, at a uh, venture capital fund? Um, if you're interested in that, ask me later. I'll be very happy to talk about it. But um, I'm not here to talk about you know, uh, venture capital funds and money. Uh, very unfortunate. Um, I'm here to talk about something a little different, which is the missing user stories. And uh, I'm sure you've all heard of user stories. If you do agile, if you do also, uh, you know, product, or if you do development, you get user stories maybe from your uh, product manager or someone, and you probably heard the term. And this talk is about the user stories that no one writes. Apparently there are a few. So um, I'm going to give an example of a user story because it's worth knowing what we're talking about. So, yeah, always a problem. So the basic structure of a user story is something like this. A user story is an informal description of a feature or product. And you know, there are a lot of uh, formats. This is just one of them. Uh, as a persona, I want to something so that I can achieve some goal. And that's the basic structure. It gives us context about the feature, what it's supposed to do, uh, what we want it to do, and most importantly, what, we, what the user wants to achieve. So the essence of a user story is who wants to do something, a persona, what they want to do, um, why, when, well, you know, some context. But the most important part is the why. And I'll circle back to that in a bit. So let me give an example of a user story. Sorry. Just going to throw away the clicker. Um, as a conference organizer, I want to export a list of attendees so I can print tags. So we have a persona, the conference organizer sitting over there, um, who wants to do, achieve something. In this case, export the list of attendees. And the why, because they want to print name tags, for example. But we usually have more than one persona in our products. For example, in this case, we have the conference attendees, all of us. And we usually have you know, a slightly different goal, also tied to the, you know, uh, to the product, but the, the goals might be a little different, the features might be a little different. In this case, I want to pay electronically so I can register online, because, you know, who wants to give a check nowadays? That's kind of annoying, really. So, yeah, that's pretty cool, but uh, we're not here to talk about those you know, pretty obvious user stories. We're here to talk about the user stories that no one writes, like this one. As a user, I would like to change my mind. Or maybe I made a mistake. Um, for example, you know, I registered at the conference and I um, misspelled my name. And then for the rest of the conference, I have to wear a name tag that says uh, David. <laughs> That's kind of awkward, isn't it? Um, you'd be surprised how many systems don't support this. Just you know, going back and changing something. And I'm sure you've all experienced this. Um, if you look online, you might find a lot of things like this. I've done something, now I want to fix it. What do I do? And it's such a simple use case. Why, why don't we support this? And you would think that you know, maybe you know, one pe person got it wrong. Uh, no, no. So many people get it wrong. So many people. And then there's my fa personal favorite. You know what happens if you Google for, I've accidentally deleted something? <laughs> so, I mean, we're all human, we all must make mistakes, we change our minds, you know, one second after you print, uh, click submit, you're like, oh, wait, I didn't mean to, to order two tickets, actually, I need one. Why don't we support this? And you know what's interesting? Eight hours a day, five days a week, we're developers, we're developing some IT system, but the rest of the time, we're users of other people's IT systems, and we experience this every day. Yet we write systems that don't allow, you know, handling errors and changing our minds. That's um, pretty annoying. And sometimes, you know, you change your mind, and the thing you want to change is even more fundamental. It's something like, um, I want to rename my account. Now, that is a world of pain. Because think about it. What happened if you used your email as a primary key in a database? Or maybe you have a reference to it, or um, a unique constraint problem, right? 
And uh, what happens with the previous name? Can someone else use it? Should I leave a tombstone? Should, uh, should it be an alias, a redirect? That's, you know, a lot of really complicated questions. Um, so it turns out that a lot of systems, again, don't support this. Um, if you look at the internet, you'll find many, many questions, many complaints like this. Um, I simply want to change my profile name. What's the problem? Why can't I do this? I want to change my email address, you know, because maybe I'm not using that old ISP anymore and I moved to Gmail or something. Seems legit, I think. Maybe I want to change my uh, username. And even large vendors sometimes, you know, fail with this. It's really, really complicated, apparently. And then there's the nightmare scenario. I want to delete my account. Ooh. Why would you ever do that? <laughs> you love us. You're such a great customer. Why would you want to live and delete your account? Um, are you dead or something? That's a whole you know, different problem. I, I don't even want to go into that. Um, turns out that this is a very, very big problem because you know, on the internet, once you put something out there, people will start linking to it, right? And what, ha what happens once you have external references to something? You get something like this. You remember LeftPad? Node.js, NPM? A tiny model, 11 lines of code, of JavaScript code. I don't know if you could call it code, but yeah. Um, 11 lines of code, and it broke the internet. Why? Because someone deleted the code. It was his model. He decided to delete it, and suddenly the entire internet broke. Because apparently a lot of frameworks, a lot of other libraries, had references to that tiny library. And when he moved it, bam, everything blew up. Um, yeah, so you know what they did to fix this? Some other developer decided to take over the namespace and upload his code, which basically does the same thing, and, and that's how he fixed it. But then it made everyone realize that if he could do that, also malicious users could do that. And that's a big problem, isn't it? So you would think that we would find a solution, but this is the end result. NPM decided that you can no longer pull off your models off of uh, NPM. You can no longer delete your accounts because, you know, once, once it's on the internet and people start linking to it, yeah, that's it. Deletion is a very, very hard problem. And even if you allow it, you need to think about this seriously um, because it's not easy. What happens on other repositories? So uh, here's an example. This is from RubyGems. And um, I'll read you the highlighted paragraph. Uh, once you've yanked all versions of a gem, anyone can push onto that, gem, that same namespace and effectively take it over. Ouch. So what's the situation with GitHub, for example, or uh, Amazon S3 buckets? Interesting questions, I think. So, you know, as a user, after encountering all of that, you're pretty pissed off, aren't you? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is how I, I usually respond when, when I'm trying to change something I, I can't. And, and what do you do as a user when you're in this situation? Who do you call? You call the support center, of course. And uh, as a support agent, you really want to help someone. I mean, they phone you up, and they're really, really mad usually. I don't know why. Um, and they're like, I just want you to change my email. Can you do that? And like, okay, 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 okay. Let's see what you did first. Right? Because you want to you trace. You want to see what they did wrong. And uh, it's a problem. Because apparently, no one thought that the customer support agent is also a user of the system. So like, who thinks about their user experience? Do they have a back office you know, uh, UI? Do they even have an API? Do they maybe need to go into the database and manually change records? Have you ever seen a user story or you know, a product feature for a back office? That's actually pretty rare. And it turns out that this is a very, very common thing. People need help, and we actually employ people to help them. But we don't give them the tools to do that, do we? So do we have audit logs? Do we have back office uh, you know, interfaces? I don't know. But then you, know, you find the problem, and you want to fix it. You want to do some modification, some change of data for, on behalf of the user. And the question is, can you do that? Do you have permissions? Did we think about that when we built the, our permission system? 
or maybe we need to resort to very, very nasty tricks like impersonation. And if we resort to impersonation, where in the log does it say that you know, the person who did this is not actually the user but someone else? That's a really big problem. And we need to think about that up front. So, you know, we have all those problems and, and the customer support agent, you know, is really trying to do his best to help. But you know what he's usually getting? Something like this. It's like, oh, God. I need to phone the operator. I, need to, I don't know who's on shift now, but I, I need to call the sysadmin or the operation engineer and, and they need to fix this. It's because, like, this is ridiculous. Just want to get my work done. So you phone the operator, and then we have another type of user. Because you know, the operator is also interacting with the system. He's also a user of the system. And he also, or she, also have you know, this user story that we need to support. Um, as an operator, I would like to debug my system in production, because you know, this is where the system is running. Um, can I do that? Has anyone ever seen logs or monitoring as a feature? on the feature list? Because I haven't. And, you know, people always forget that, you know, somewhat, some time in the future, during the life of the system, we will have to do this. Can we do that? How is, going, how is the UX for that, the user experience of the operator going to be like? Is it going to be horrible? Do you, would you have to stare at black screens with weird text for hours on end? Probably yes. That's not going to be fun, is it? Um, so, okay, so as an operator, you do what you can, and, and you find the bug, and then you go to the developer, and you're like, uh, okay, let's fix this. And it turns out the developer is also you know, kind of a user. He's also interacting with the system, and who cares about the developer user experience? I would think the developer would care about the developer user experience. Turns out, most people, nope. Nope. You just want to get to you know, fix this bug, but the code is so long and so complicated and, and your tooling, they're really bad, and you know, this takes much longer than you want, and you're pretty miserable because the user experience that we have as developers is just horrible, because it's not a feature. No one thinks that we're users. And then, you know, you want to add a feature. You fix the bug, you just want to add a feature. So suddenly things like um, code quality, code structure, documentation, um, CI, they become a product feature. This is not something that, um, that we just get, you know, just to get stuff rolling. No, this is a feature and we have to treat it as such. And that's very important to understand. But we have many more users that we don't think about. For example, you know, as a developer, I want to add a feature. Um, how do I know if the feature is successful? How do I know if people li uh, like it or if they want it? I need BI, right? And you know who else likes uh, or needs BI? Marketers. Turns out we have those weird people in the company that try to, to do this weird thing and sell the product to customers. Who would think that uh, anyone would do that? Um, and they need data. They want to measure conversion. They want to measure you know, if users like what they do. And they need support for that. And that is also a feature that needs to be integrated and implemented inside of the system. And we tend to ignore them. They have their own needs. Sometimes they need you know, special development. I worked at this one company that had marketing R&D, as weird as it sounds. And it's actually very, very important. And then we have what I think is the most important user story that never, no one ever writes. As a user, I would like to use a simple product. Right? And, and this is a very interesting one because think about this. This is a feature that says no more features. And again, everyone ignores that. You, you remember that PDF reader that everyone used to like that does everything, including making coffee, but the one thing I wanted it to do, which is read this PDF, eh, that it doesn't do so well. Everything else, amazing. I just want a simple product. I have a job that I want done. That's it. And, you know, you, you buy a product from a very reputable company. Oh, come on. A very reputable company, and you get this. You get a book, like this, this thick. It's like, 
do, do I actually have to read this? You remember those days when we had courses and books for, for software? Has anyone seen the, the book on Gmail or Google Docs or Facebook? Because those are not simple platforms. Have you noticed how we stopped having books for software? Interesting, eh? This didn't, didn't happen by accident. It's not a mistake. We started designing simpler products because somewhere along the, the way, we understood that people want simple products. It's not written anywhere. It should be, but it's not. But yeah, this is what we should do. Because I, for one, don't want to read another book about Excel ever in my life. So we have a list of stuff that should be a feature, but are never a feature. Like stuff like logs, metrics, you know, code structure, architecture, um, back office for uh, customer support agents, audit trails, recovery from errors, and of course simplicity. And they're never a product, and they're never a feature. They're, there's never a story for that. And the question is, why? Why are those things never a feature? Anyone would, do, would care to uh, offer an explanation? So I have a few thoughts about that. Um, one of those is that we focus on features instead of goals. We forget the why. You remember that tiny why in the beginning, um, that tiny part of the story where, that we tend to omit? People have a job they want done. And if we focus on the job to be done, we would understand that everything else doesn't actually matter. Often the users don't care how they get their job done, they just want it done. And when we start thinking holistically about this, when we start thinking about the goals, what the users are actually trying to achieve, we start you know, tracking the users, we, try, uh, we start understanding how they work and what they do. And then we find something very interesting. Who is a user? A user is anyone working with a system. Anyone. That includes you know, developers, operations, customer support agents. It also includes some you know, people we forgot to even exist in the company, like legal. Once you have GDPR, legal is going to be very, very interested in product features, like that tiny feature of you know, allowing users to delete their data because you're now obligated to do so. And suddenly legal, they become users. And marketing people, they're also users. Sales, business people, they're all you know, types of users that we have to support and we have to think about their user stories and how they're going to use the product. Very, very important. Um, and then you, you go to this developer and you're asking him, um, have you thought about all of this? And he's like, oh no, no, of course not. No one is using my software project. I mean, my, my software project is just on GitHub. It has no users. Um, that's kind of weird. Every active software project has at least one user. You know who that is? That user? Want to take a guess? Exactly, the developer. That's the first user that every software project always has. Always. And we need to remember this because this is the ultimate continuous delivery uh, experience. When you are the user of your own software, when you're writing, let's say, uh, a tool for yourself, you get amazing feedback. You write something, you use it, you're like, oh, God, who wrote this? I hate this. So you go immediately and you fix it. You're also the operator, so you, if, you have, you know, if it crashes, you immediately fix it, and you understand that you need to debug it because you do it all the time. So there's no way, absolutely no way, you will forget any of those you know, features that I talked about. But once you, know, you grow and you, know, you have a company with departments and managers and projects, we start to forget all of this. We start to forget things like, like that, that errors are a normal part of life. We, we somehow imagine a perfect world where our lovely diagrams that, you know, has no extra branches for you know, all the variations and all the mistakes that people might do or you know, people who change their minds. We think that this is reality. And uh, when a user says, oh, come on, I can't use your software, it's like, you're an idiot. Why didn't you read the manual or this book? Here in the book on page 372, it says explicitly that you should never ever do this, right? <laughs> I don't want to read this book. And you know, it's, it's, even this, you know, uh, slide is wrong because those are not L's. Those are variations. 
every person on this planet behaves slightly differently. And even that person behaves slightly differently you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yesterday I did this, tomorrow I'm going to do something a little different. It's going to be similar, but not exactly the same. And variations, that tends to be a very, a very, very, um, how shall I put it, integral part of our lives. Everything has variation. And if you build a system that does not support variation, someone is going to have to fix that. That someone will probably be customer support and developers and operators. And yeah, this is how you get more and more personas into your system. The more users you have, the more variations you will have, the more good stuff that people will try to do, and the more personas that you will need uh, to support in order to fix this. The larger the system, the more personas, and we have to keep you know, tabs on this. We have to add more user stories to match all of those personas and support their needs. What we need is a holistic view of systems. We need to understand that when we do something here, it has an effect here, or here, or here. And if we don't understand that you know, the product, the company, it's a system, that system includes the end users and the developers and everyone, we will not understand you know, the effects of what we do. So, the essence of all of this is feedback loops. We'll get it wrong. That's, you know, a given. What's important is, is that we don't break this feedback loop. That when we get it wrong, we understand how the user feels, we understand how the customer support agent feels, how the operator, how the developer feels. We understand their use cases. We learn from it, and we do it better the next time. And we iterate on that again and again and again, until eventually we get something that is better. And we never stop. And this is the essence of DevOps. The essence of DevOps is feedback loops. It's creating and reinforcing feedback loops that work to continuously improve the products and the companies that we make. So, um, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, <laughs> you might have questions about this uh, picture, but I'm not going to answer them. Um, so, now is a good time. I often experience that a developer will um, exclude the variations in his code. And so you get some, some beautiful feature somewhere, and, and you think, oh, cool code, I, I use that one. And the next uh, part is uh, it won't work. It, it breaks because somewhere deep inside the variation is excluded. And how uh, can, can I achieve to uh, convince the, the others not to exclude variations at the first. That's easy, because as I sa I've said, um, every developer is also a user of someone else's IT system. Start talking to them about their experience with other IT systems that uh, don't allow for variations. They will get mad pretty, <laughs> pretty uh, fast, and they're like, oh, you see? And um, actually, if you're dogfooding, if you're using your own system, probably you will experience that too. Uh, what we did at uh, my previous company is uh, we, we listened in on uh, customer support calls. We had recordings, and uh, sometimes we even took shifts at the customer uh, support center. And y you have no idea, like maybe you do, but like, I had no idea before I started listening how mad users get because of those things. And once you hear someone yelling on the phone for 15 minutes, you're like, okay, okay, I got this. <laughs> like, then you understand. Okay, so um, might it be that uh, the problems you describe uh, arise from probably external pressure to deliver something or uh, customers who are uh, um, funding the development are not willing to pay for those uh, missing user stories because they probably do not understand why they should? That's very true. Unfortunately, you're going to pay. You're either going to pay for development or you're going to pay for 100 people in the customer support center. Your choice. Probably customer support center is going to be more expensive. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sometimes very hard to explain this to, to management. 
Okay, um, you mentioned at the beginning that goals are the most important part of user stories, but in most of your examples you skipped the goals. Yes, Maybe you I can did. comment on that, so eat your own dog food. That is very true. Um, that was uh, on purpose and it's nice that you noticed. Um, this is because if you miss those goals, if you don't put those goals, this is how you get to those um, very uh, poor situations that I've mentioned. So well done. Yeah. Um, so this is maybe more like a comment. You ask in the middle, why are these things missing? And so there's this one saying that, uh, I don't care if the data center is on fire, as long as you deliver value to the users, I'm happy. So especially as a CEO, which has not an engineering background, I'm like, I don't really care what you do with your like, first versions. I just want a website which looks like that and has these features. So it's quite natural that such a CEO like would skip all this kind of um, more like support uh, and operations kinds of user stories because it's not driving business value at least not initially so kind of it's it's um, the difficulty of a uh, like uh, executive to understand how a veil oiled and, and nice uh, um, IT system looks like. So maybe this is one of the reasons why uh, companies that are, have technical founders end up with better systems or with like, um, like a, have a better holistic view on this whole thing than, than others. So does that, um, do you think that, that there's some truth to that, that this can be one of the reasons and if so, how can we help like, maybe non-technical executives to, to get a better understanding of the whole system and how a good holistic IT system should look like? Um, there's a point to what you say. Um, definitely technical founders are better at this, um, but I don't think it's because they're more technical. I think it's because they've experienced more systems. I think that the key here is to become the user of your own system. To, to try and understand the customer point of view of the system because to the customer, the company is just one entity. They don't care, you know, you know if, you're, if you're working at the company, they don't, they don't care that you're a developer or the janitor or, you know, the guy from accounting, they don't care. You're working at that company that destroyed their life yesterday, you know, at 2 a.m. where they were, you know, clicking like crazy trying to order something. And um, if you start to think about the system from the customer point of view. Like you said, I don't care if the data center is on fire. I, I don't even care if there is a data center as a client. Um, if you start thinking about this from the customer point of view, you will find that the customer interaction actually spans quite a few departments. Because you start using the system on the web UI, and then you phone someone that's a whole different department, and then maybe you open a feature request that's, again, a whole different department. And as a user, you might have you know, multiple interactions with the company, um, all with different people. And for, for you, it's the same entity. And once you start looking at the company from the customer point of view, a lot of things fall into place. Uh, so that's my experience, at least. Yeah, I wanted to mention something about account deletion. Um, I, I had this situation a couple of times before as well. I, I think everybody had. Uh, but thanks to GDPR, this is going to be a user story now. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. I think it has to be the last one because uh, I'm getting weird looks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and my experience um, as developer, if you are uh, fixing an error and you're uh, scrolling through long log files and something like that and you, you don't get the point of the error in, inside the log file, that's the moment you have to do this story yourself. Um, there are lots of colleagues who are not uh, increasing the information for finding logs, uh, finding errors in, in, the, in the log file, but in this moment when, when I uh, spent half a day in scrolling through tons of log files, that's the moment I have to spend half an hour of my time to increase the information for, for an error. And th I think um, you, uh, a major developer should implement those, story, those stories it's himself. And 
and they won't be written, but they should have been done. Yeah, that's quite true. Um, thank you very much. So Abishai, <clears throat> when I understand your um, talk, feedback loop is one of the essentials for being successful with DevOps? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for you. the workshop you have already given and for the two workshops you will give tomorrow. Okay. And yeah, thank okay. you. Thanks. <laughs>